the year of World War II's end brought a very important meeting in Germany. A group of ministers met to discuss why the church in Germany had failed to take a stand against some of the very blatant evils that had developed under the reign of the Third Reich. Some of the ministers in this meeting were pleading with others, trying to justify their actions and failures by appealing to demonic forces that surely were at work and had led them astray in Germany. But another minister very boldly stood up before them to reproach them. And he said, gentlemen, we have all been very foolish. I read that story this week, and the reality is those two statements were both very true in the churches of Galatia. There was a spiritual deception that was going on in the gospel war, but it was also surrounded by foolishness amongst the people of God. So as we continue this series in the third chapter, let us consider spiritual deception that we face in the gospel war. Hear with me the Lord's word. Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in, v- in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. This is the word of the Lord. Paul begins to interrogate the Galatians here. He is bringing the heat to them, if you will, in the first few verses of the third chapter. You see these rapid-fire questions that he's throwing at them, along with some particularly strong language in verse 1. He begins and he says, O foolish Galatians. The Bible translator J.B. Phillips has rendered this, O you dear idiots of Galatia. Eugene Peterson rendered this, you crazy idiots. Galatians. Now, as much as some pastors might like to talk to their congregations that way, that is not at all, I think, the spirit of how Paul is speaking to the church there. This is not a reviling of the people. This is a godly, biblical criticism of a church that has went astray. This is not spite. This is a godly parent correcting their children and calling out what is dangerous amongst them. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Sometimes we have to call wrong behavior for what it is. Now, the word foolish here means literally not understanding, lacking in the power of perception. He is not saying they are stupid. He is not saying they are morally deficient or mentally deficient. He is not talking about the the 2000s and uh, some foolish character like a Homer Simpson or, for those of you who are older in the congregation, the infamous 
three stooges. He is instead using the language of the book of Proverbs. And he is talking about the fool as Jesus himself defines the fool in Proverbs. You see, in Proverbs, a fool is someone who is fixed in the correctness of their own opinions and can't hear anything outside of them. They are literally deaf to wisdom. What I mean by that is wisdom finds them out. Wisdom speaks to them, and the fool refuses good counsel and rejects it. The fool is willfully determined to not follow what is right before them. This is how Proverbs 1 reveals this. Wisdom cries aloud in the street, and in the market she raises her voices. Even at the head of the noisy street she cries out, and at the entrance of the city gates she speaks. Now notice what comes next. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in your scoffing and fools hate knowledge? So a fool fails to use their spiritual intelligence when faced with the truth. The truth is staring right in front of them. It's actually shouting out to them, but they have a wrong heart attitude and they have a lack of faith. Now listen, nobody likes to be called a fool. There is no doubt at that, at, about that at all. Sometimes parents have to do the hard work of telling their children, you are acting a fool. And I don't mean in the Mr. T, I pity the fool variety. And our children get very offended at this. Why would you speak to me this way? Well, these are words that Paul is speaking with gravitas, with parental love. I think also with a emotion, compassion flowing through it. You rejected the teaching of the truth and you have bought into a lie and it's affecting you. It's hurting you. This is true, spiritually foolish behavior. Proverbs 12, 15 says it this way, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Again, they are not called foolish because they lack intelligence, but because of their lack of obedience to the intelligence they've been given. Paul is grieved over them. This is a wake-up call. And before someone here says it's unloving to call someone a fool, we'll tell that to the one where we can find no greater love, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said everyone who hears the words of mine, and does not do them in Matthew 7. And by the way, this was the end of his sermon. This was the conclusion. This was the modern mic drop, if you will. He says, you are like a foolish man who would build his house on the sand. In other words, you have all the tools. You can build the house but instead of doing what is so clear and right in front of you, building it on the rock, you would build it on the sand. Or how Jesus spoke to his very own followers after his resurrection, when he said, you are fools and slow of heart to believe. You see, their hearts were really desirous of the wrong things. They knew up here what was right, but they refused to listen to what God had told them. That is true foolishness indeed. There's a million things that can make us act foolishly. Pressure, society, influence, selfishness, sensuality, and a million other words I could throw at you. But the point is, when wisdom calls, when you have the truth presented before you, but you choose to do it your way, you have chosen the way of the fool. Now, the second thing Paul says here in this first verse is who has bewitched you? Now, this word is only used here in the New Testament. Who has bewitched you? The word had its origin in sorcery, in paganism, in magic. It is defined as to mislead by pretenses as if by magic arts to influence someone with a charm or to give someone the popular superstition of an evil eye, to cast a spell over someone. So your power is irresistible. 
Now, kids, you know what the evil eye is when your mother or grandmother starts twitching in one of them because you have stepped on the wrong nerve and pushed the wrong button. That's kind of the idea here. The ancient Greeks were accustomed to and afraid of the idea that a spell could hypnotize you. In fact, the tradition goes back to a serpent hypnotizing its prey with its eyes if you stared into it. And once the victim looked into the eye, a spell could be cast. Now, many commentators and preachers, when they read this, they say this is just a figure of speech, which it is a figure of speech, but it's just a figure of speech, and they kind of gloss over it and keep moving. But I actually think there's something going on more here. In fact, yesterday I was reading Calvin's sermon on this passage, and I was really encouraged to see that he thought the same thing. Calvin says, this looks like something supernatural, that after enjoying the gospel in such clearness, they should be affected by the delusions of Satan. You see, they were acting foolish, but I think there was also a spiritual deception that was going on in the church. And I think often in our lives, but we don't see it, recognize it, or want to see it for that matter. Now, why do I think this is more of a spiritual deception? Well, if you go towards the end of the book, turn with me to Galatians 5 for just a moment, and look with me at verse 19. Paul is giving one of his famous lists. He gives a lot of lists in his letters, and this list is about the works of the flesh. And there's something in here in Galatians 5 that he warns about. And it is important to note this because I think this gives validity to how I want to interpret this idea of spiritual deception. Look at verse 19. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. And then mattering your translation, the next one there is sorcery or witchcraft. Do you see that? This was a problem. There is evil in the world. There are supernatural forces at work. Paul says here, who has bewitched you? Back in chapter 3, verse 1. There is a spiritual and satanic war going on in the world and even in the church. And if you remember, agitators had come into the Galatian churches, intruders, people who were trying to call people to follow the law instead of follow Christ. And in particular, we see in the book of Galatians that these deceitful workers had like spellbound the church to leave the truth, everything Paul had invested in them, into believing a lie, just as Satan comes as an angel of light. This is why Peter warns us to be sober-minded. Why? Because the devil is an adversary, and he's like a roaring lion. He's trying to devour the church. So what do we have to do? We have to resist him firm in our faith. We're going to see today that the answer to spiritual deception is a return to wisdom and faith. That's the only way to defeat it. Now, when we look here at this, the, the point I think that is trying to be made is that Satan is trying to get our eyes off of Jesus and off of the cross and off of his word and get us spellbound by a million other things. He wants to seduce us with an evil eye. There were spiritual, satanic things at work in the world then as there are now. We need to know that any spiritual experience or worship outside of what God has declared in Holy Scripture has a supernatural dimension to it, which is evil and demonic. We are told in the law, in Deuteronomy 32, that the people stirred God to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. How? They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. What is going on there? Well, what the Lord is saying through Moses is that 
the people of Israel thought that they were adding these new types of worship into their old type of worship to the Lord, to Yahweh. They thought that they could add a little Baalism, a little worship of Astra, with how the Bible prescribes worship to be more contemporary, to be more current, to be more relatable, to be more politically correct. And they thought that that would be okay, that you could do the two at once and everything would work out. And the Lord is saying, no, you thought you were worshiping me, but you were really worshiping demons. You see, there is no walking the fence, straddling the line. You are either really worshiping the Lord or there is something supernatural and evil going on in what you're doing. Satan is doing everything he can, listen to me, everything he can to deceive us and to bewitch us, to keep our eyes and our hearts focused on the wrong things. We as a people are more worried about Mother Nature than we are about Father God. We are bombarded in our culture with white witchcraft, horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, video games packed with mind-numbing, captivating, occultic symbols, inanimate statues everywhere of Buddha and happy cat and good luck charms and amulets and crystals and medicine wheels and dream catchers. And if he can't catch us in the very clearly occultic things, he will get our eyes off Jesus by being consumed with social media threads and sports obsessions and 24-7 news cycles and polarizing politics and books imported with superstitious pagan beliefs and even quizzes on social media where we find our true personality and true spirituality and smartphones that we are addicted to and we can't stop looking at all day long, picking it up, average person, like 150 times a day. Or even Enneagram and Dist Test who tell us who we really are instead of who God tells us we are. By the way, did you ever notice that the Enneagram and Disc, which I mean, I use Disc in counseling sometimes and all these other personality tests, there's never any bad personalities in them. Did you notice that? Everything's good and positive. There's just a problem with that. There are bad personalities. There are sinful behaviors, but they gloss all over that to make it all look good. All of these things can replace having an eye on Jesus Christ. God warned us to put away this kind of thing. He says in Leviticus 19, don't turn to mediums. Don't turn the necromancers, those who seek after the dead. Do not seek them out and make yourselves unclean by them. He says in chapter 20, instead, consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am Yahweh, your God. I am the Lord, your God. You see, we need to do some self-evaluation today. Not only have we been acting foolish, but has more of the world gotten into us than we have went to influence the world as the church. Are I, our eyes Monday through Friday on Christ or are they on something else? Notice he says here, you did not obey the truth. They had the truth. They didn't keep it. We have 24 hours a day that God has given us. But how many of those hours or moments are our eyes ever on Jesus Christ? We can't even find five minutes a day to get a daily crumb from God, but we can set our minds on a million other things that keep our eyes from ever thinking on Jesus Christ. We wonder why we are depressed, anxious, afraid, angry, confused all the time. I ask you this question, are you deceived or do you believe? That's going to be where Paul is going to be getting at in this passage. Listen, he says that before your eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Those words can be said in every godly biblical church out there. Paul lived among them. He gave the true gospel to them right before their eyes. He clearly preached the cross of Jesus. 
the death of Jesus. He clearly gave the Lord's Supper, the sacrament, the table of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, done in remembrance of him. Friends, whether he was in the city streets, whether he was sitting down in people's homes, or whether it was on Sunday in the Lord's Day gathering, he was like a broken record. He had one message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. The language here of being clearly portrayed speaks of the official notices that would be put out in the marketplaces or in public locations for a citizen to read. This would be like a modern day billboard. You can't miss it. You're driving down the street. It's everywhere. The true gospel was posted before their eyes. It was written in large capital letters. No painter could have depicted more vividly Jesus Christ than Paul. Even those of the weakest sight could not miss the billboards that Paul had painted before them. But these intruders had come into the Galatian churches and they had graffitied the billboard. They had marred the beautiful painting of Christ. They had corrupted it. They had gotten the people's minds off of them. And instead of looking at the masterpiece of the gospel, they were looking at putrid works of art. It's amazing some modern art today. Literally people take cans of paint and spray paint and they throw it at a wall and they make catastrophe and someone is foolish enough to spend thousands of dollars for that. Listen, I've got a little artist, in my, a couple artists in my house actually. But when my kids were like three, they could do that. But people would rather look at abstract nothingness than look at truth and beauty. Isn't that something? Why is that? That is because we are too easily satisfied as people. We are not willing to really do the work that God has called us to. Every Sunday when this church worshiped, when they opened the Bible, every time they took the bread and the cup, Jesus Christ was truly and clearly portrayed before them. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Listen, some of us think if only we had lived 2,000 years ago and saw Jesus die on the cross, our faith would be so much stronger. I want to remind you that there were thousands of people who saw Jesus Christ with their physical eyes die 2,000 years ago, and all they did was shout out, crucify him. But this church, the churches of Galatia, our church today, every church that loves Jesus, we have the sight of the cross and resurrection every Sunday. And it is effectual in us by faith. So Paul is saying here, how do you break the spell of seduction in the world? By looking to the cross with the eyes of faith. And then he gets very direct in verse 2. He begins to ask all of these questions. This I want to ask of you, a very important question that goes back to the root of the problem. problem. Did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, when you are trying hard to please God, when you are trying to keep the Ten Commandments, when you are trying to keep the 613 laws in Exodus to Deuteronomy, is that what made you closer to God? Did God give you the Holy Spirit and a new heart because of how good of a person you were and because how successful you were at keeping the law? You see... This idea here is so foreign to the gospel. And yet this is exactly what so many churches peddle as they graffiti the masterpiece of the cross of Jesus. You see, we are told in passages like 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that this giving of the Holy Spirit is the experience of every single Christian, not just the elite, not just the powerful, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says there, By one Holy Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, the church. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we're slaves or free, we have all been made to drink of one Spirit. 
In fact, he says in Romans 8, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not God's. You're not Christ. You're not saved. Did you get the Holy Spirit because you went through the checklist of the law of Moses and you started trying to keep all those laws? I got bad news for you. If you think you're good enough to do that, James says, if you try to keep the whole law and you break one law, you're guilty of all of them. All right? The reality is, you try to keep three or four, and you're going to fail at the other six of the Ten Commandments. It doesn't matter how hard you try. How did you get the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you how I got the Holy Spirit. It is a gift of God. He is a gift of God. Salvation is His work. Amen. Ezekiel 36, God says, the new covenant here. This is how you get the Holy Spirit. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean from your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh, a living, breathing, spiritual heart. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Notice the order in chapter 36. How do you get to keep the law of God and love the law of God? What comes first? Is it you keeping the law and then you get the Spirit? Or God gives you the Holy Spirit in a new heart and then you keep the law? Too many of us are pulling the cart before the horse instead of the horse pulling the cart. You can't do this on your own. You can't keep the law. You can't be good enough on your own. He says here, it didn't come by the works of the law. It came by the hearing of faith. Faith is not working. Faith is receiving. I know the word faith has come under hard times in the modern world. Etymologically, there's a lot of confusion of what the word faith means. So let's define it. It means trust, reliance clinging to something. It's not simply intellectual at all. It is a trust. Faith comes by hearing, Paul says in Romans 10, hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. Charles Spurgeon once gave a beautiful illustration of faith, which sets the record straight as to how we can get our eyes back in the right place, how we can get our hearts free from foolishness and spiritual seduction. Spurgeon once said in a sermon, your condition is like that of a child, a young child in a house that is caught on fire. The boy has escaped upstairs as the fire raged and has made it to the edge of a window. And the flames have gotten so into the room and the smoke has become so obnoxious that the boy has had to get up on the ledge, turn his body around, and now he is hanging with all his might from the sill of the window a few stories high. The flames are pouring out of the window underneath him. And the poor child will soon be burned or will fall down and be broken to pieces and die. This boy is literally holding on with the clutches of death. The smoke is making him sick. The heat is making him sweat and beginning to burn his skin. His clothes begin to feel like they are literally melting and his flesh is starting to smell from the heat that surrounds him. This child would not dare to relax his grasp of the windowsill for one second unless he could trust there is something underneath him to help him. All of a sudden, a strong man comes underneath of him and says, Boy, drop, drop, I will catch you, I will save you, trust me, drop. Now, it would be no saving faith for the boy to believe that the man is strong or that the man is capable. That would be a good help toward faith, but just believing that the man was capable of doing it is not faith. He might have known that and yet have held on in his own might and strength, until the flames engulfed him and he died on that window ledge. It was faith and faith alone when the boy trusted that strong man and let go and dropped down into his big friend's arms 
and was saved. Spurgeon writes, There you are, sinner, clinging to your sins and to your good works, and the Savior is crying out, Drop, drop into my arms. It is not doing. It is leaving off your doing. It is not working. It is trusting in that work which Jesus has already done. Trust. That is the word. Simple, solid, hearty, earnest. Trust. Trust. And it will not take an hour to save you. The moment you trust, you are saved. Unquote. I ask you, are you deceived or do you believe? He continues on. In verse 3, are you so foolish? Have you been so easily duped? Is your life so off track, detoured, lost, feeling hopeless? I was a fool for so long, you say. I began in the spirit. Why in the world would I think that I'm going to get it right by the flesh? How could this imperfect, sinful man ever be good enough for God? I'll never perfect it. Being good is never good enough. The prophet Isaiah says, my good works are like filthy rags, a polluted garment in God's sight. Paul says in Philippians 3, my righteousness doesn't come from the law, from trying to do what God told me to do. My righteousness comes through Jesus Christ in faith in what he did perfectly for me. I will only be able to do what God wants me to do after I've had Jesus' righteousness on me. Only after he has changed me and saved me. So when you look at verse 4 through 5, he says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or does he do it By the hearing of faith. Listen, in this gospel battle, sometimes we have to suffer. Believing on Jesus is not a promise of a feather bed, you know, tiptoeing through the roses and and just an easy, simple life the rest of your life. You still live in a hostile environment called the world. And the reality was when you believe in Jesus, sometimes family members divorce themselves from you. Sometimes they oppose you. Jesus warned that this would often be the case. You don't suffer when you're a nice, politically correct lemming who goes with the flow. You suffer when you do what is right, when everyone else is doing what is wrong. Jews would often say that you are dead to me if you believe in Jesus as the Messiah. The heathens who were polytheistic would say to these Galatian Christians, you have become an atheist. You've given up worshiping all of our gods. For one God, you sound like an atheist. And we know when Paul went to these churches and planted them in Acts 13 and 14, in his first missionary journey, he suffered. I mean, we're told in Acts 13, the leading Jews expelled him from the city of Pisidian Antioch. In Acts 14, he goes to Iconium, and they poison the people's minds against the Christians. And then later in chapter 14, at at Antioch and Iconium, they stone Paul with literal stones, leaving him as dead. And I'm sure this kind of animosity poured over into the churches after he left. But I love here how Paul leaves a loophole of doubt, doesn't he? He says that if indeed it was in vain. In other words, Paul believes that they might have had their eyes off Jesus for a while, but Jesus hasn't taken his eyes off them. In other words, he's saying most of you in this church, your faith isn't in vain. You might be off track. You might be despondent. You might be broken, but there is hope for you. You don't have to say stay spiritually seduced. You can get your eyes back on Jesus and get back on the path he has called you to. There are so many things trying to get us off the path. Sometimes it's relationships, being unequally yoked in business or in dating. Sometimes it's finance. And sometimes it's just idle time that we waste away and let the enemy control. Now, as we close today in the last few verses, we want to introduce for our last five minutes here the gospel in the Old Testament. 
I want us to see that Paul is going to make this so abundantly clear. He's going to say, look, you think you're good enough? You can keep the law? You can just do works and get to heaven? You're going to believe these intruders who've seduced you? All right, let's go back to the first Jew, the first patriarch, the father of Israel, the beginning of the Old Testament. Let's go back to Abraham as an example, and we're just going to introduce it today. Look at verses 6 through 9 as we close. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. By the way, that includes the Galatian churches and even those Pensacola churches. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. I ask you again, are you deceived or do you believe? That's what Paul wants us to hear here. Abraham, the patriarch. Listen, when he was alive, Moses wasn't born yet. Moses wasn't even going to be born for hundreds of years. No law had yet been written by God with his finger in the Ten Commandments. Abraham believed God and was made right with God before the law of Moses was given. In fact, before there was an Israel, there was an Abraham. Abraham was the first Jew. Abraham was a pagan. We read in Genesis 15 these words just quoted. Notice here, the word of the Lord came to Abraham and said, This man, Ishmael, will not be your heir. Your very own son will be your heir. And then he said, as he brought him outside, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he accounted it to him as righteousness. Now, why do I bring this up? Because remember the whole talk about circumcision and the law? Well, circumcision, Abraham doesn't get circumcised until Genesis chapter 17, many years later. There is no law of Moses until hundreds of years later. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 400 years in Egypt, then the law is given. And yet, what do we read here at this moment? Calvin says Abraham was not justified merely because he believed that God would multiply his seed, but because he embraced the gift of God. Notice this word. He trusted to the promised mediator. He knew that the Messiah Jesus was coming in whom all of the nations of the world would be blessed. And he believed on this at this moment. Abraham is the father of God's people, not because of biology, because he's a physical patriarch of the Jews, but because of faith. Remember, we saw two weeks back, Titus was a Gentile converted by faith. He didn't need circumcision. We saw that Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 Peter went and witnessed to him. He was saved by faith, not by keeping the law or circumcision. Go to the Old Testament. You see in 2 Kings 5, Naaman the Syrian. He comes to the prophet. He is saved by faith, not by keeping the law or circumcision. In fact, go to the book of Jonah and see the wicked Assyrian Ninevites who Jonah went to preach to, who no one thought would ever be saved. There was no way they could ever be good enough to be saved. They were like Americans, all right? And it does not say there in Jonah, they received the law of Moses, they were circumcised, they offered sacrifices, they kept the law, not at all. Instead, it simply says, they believed and repented in dust and ashes, and they were saved. Abraham will not be circumcised until 14 years later. So he says here, know this. And this is imperative. This is a command to you and me. Know this. The sons of Abraham are those who are saved by faith. You want to be saved? There's only one way. The same way everyone has always been saved. All the way back to the first patriarch, Abraham. This is the whole heart of the New Testament. He says later in chapter 3, if you are Jesus, then you are Abraham's offspring and you're an heir according to the promise. 
He says in Romans 2, you're not a Jew who is one merely outwardly. Circumcision is not outward and physical. A Jew is inward and circumcision is of the heart. It's of the heart by the Spirit. Notice Romans 4. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. I ask you again, are you deceived or do you believe? When God said those words to Abraham, he preached the gospel to him. The gospel is not do more, try harder, be better, keep the law. The gospel is you are a singer, sinner, hanging on the ledge and the flames of judgment are around you. And if you trust in your own strength, your own power or abilities, you will perish. But Jesus Christ is the strong man. He has lived the perfect life you could never live. He has kept the law perfectly. And you need to put all your trust on him. You need to reorient your vision from the things of this world and set your eyes on the only one. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Dr. Harry Ironside was the pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago for many years. And he was once on vacation and he visited a Sunday school class. And as he was sitting in the classroom, the teacher asked the class this question. How were people saved in the Old Testament? And after a pause, one man raised his hand and sheepishly said, they were saved by keeping the law. And the teacher said, that's right, that's right. Dr. Ironside couldn't contain himself. He interrupted and he said, my Bible says that by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. The teacher was a little embarrassed, so he said, well, does someone else have an idea then? Another student replied, they were saved by bringing sacrifices to God in the Old Testament. The teacher said, ah, we can finally go on with the lesson. That's right. Dr. Ironside said, I'm sorry to interrupt again. But my Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away our sin. By this time, the unprepared teacher was sure the visitor knew more about the Bible than he did. And so he said, well, sir, would you please tell us how people were saved in the Old Testament? Dr. Ironside explained that they were saved the same way we are saved today, by faith. He said, sir, 21 times in Hebrews 11... As the writer of Hebrews tells us about all of the saints of history, he says they were saved by faith. Listen, the faith of our fathers in the past was directed forward to Jesus who was to come and ours rests into the Jesus who has come. Are you deceived or do you believe? Let's bow before the Lord.